Okay, so we are here. Um, I want to first say thank you um, to Tashmina for joining me for the book launch of In the Palace of Flowers. It's incredibly strange um, to be doing it digitally. Um, but I'm really, I'm very touched that everybody has turned up. Um, I'm touched by how many people registered and uh, I'm excited for all of you to get to know more about the book today and purchase it, read it, sample it for yourself. So before we go any further, this is In the Palace of Flowers. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Victoria. Um, I'm Tashmia, a writer, an artist, and a campaigner in the field of violence against women. And I'm here, I have the honor of speaking to Victoria, um, who has written this absolutely stunning debut novel, in the Palace of Flowers. Victoria, you've read literature, philosophy at Oxford, UCA, at UCL, UCH is the medical hospital, that would be, but you're also doing a further degree in neuroscience mm. now. Um, and in the pursuit of writing, you've had the pursuit of writing intelligent African women back into the world. Mm. And in doing so, you've written for The Guardian, The London Review of Books, the BBC News, and done countless other projects to get to this point. <laughs> this is kind of cool. Yeah. <laughs> um. And the Palace of Flowers, so to summarize it from what I know of the story of reading it, it's a story of two enslaved people, Abyssinian slaves, um, Jamila and Abib Malek. Um, and the story is inspired by an account, a real life account that she found of Jamila Habeshi. Mm, yeah, sure. um, and it's quite a small account that she found. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it all yeah. spiraled from there, um, mm. which is quite incredible. Um, could you maybe read a small snippet for us sure. before we then go into some of the discussions about? I will, I will. Um, yes, so I am going to do the most traditional but hopefully helpful thing and read from the beginning. So I'm going to read about a page and a half um, of chapter one. We shall be forgotten, Jamila realised, watching the funeral rites with empty eyes. She usually enjoyed the funerals. The slaves heard the tragedies first. Gossip slid through walls and under doors. Distress seeped into antechambers. The news, like the life itself, unspooled quickly. In the first house where she had served, Jamila would rise early to hear the recitation of the Quran on the roof. Back then, the older slaves would turn a blind eye while she darted into an empty bedroom to peer through a window, scanning the roofs of the houses nearby to see where the imam was reciting. He would stand on the roof that housed the deceased. The sound of his announcement, the bell to her mind. She had always enjoyed the sobriety. A life had been lost and that weight meant something. Precisely what she remained unsure. It was January almost the end of the year. Death seemed fitting as an end to a cycle. Still, Jamila did not want to be there. But whilst women were forbidden from the service, 
any Abyssinian slave who had served him had to be present. And so Jamila stood amongst them at the back of the mosque. He had been one of the noblemen free to enter the harem, a physician for the Shah and his wives. Jamila, recalling his slithery presence, suspected the slave's attendance was required to bolster the numbers. The imam's monotone never wavered. Jamila was bored. She stared up at the coved dome, dome of the mosque ceiling. Thousands of minuscule sapphire tiles adorned it. Mingled with dazzling glass, the tiles dripped from the walls. She sought to count them, but glancing around, saw hers was the only upturned face. She stared at the floor. She traced a silk embroidered shoe over the marble, wishing she could stand on the slivers of exposed stone. She looked up. Every slave in the mosque faced forward. It was nary a shuffle nor a sigh. She lowered her shoulders and lifted her chin, trying to practice solemnity. The faces of the nobles were haggard and drawn. The prince, her prince, her old playmate behind closed doors in the harem quarters, who used to sneak smiles at her with bows. He too was facing forward, his expression indistinguishable from the rest. For a moment, she wondered how he might behave at her funeral. But of course, she would not have one. Not long ago, a slave had died. He was thrown into an unmarked spot in one of the gardens where a glut of bodies lay. Jamila could not help but see them in her mind, jumbled together, anonymous, rotting, moot. Nobody was notified. Whoever his birth family was, they remained ignorant, filled with faint hope, perhaps unmuted despair. Wow. <laughs> Cheerful note. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I have to ask before we go on, are you going to do an audio book? I'd so, love to hear you do all of that. It's so different to the voice that was in my head when I was reading this. So I have been asked by a number of my fans. I think we are doing an audio book, but I do not think I am doing it. I think with good reason they have chosen someone with an African accent who can actually you know, portray. Yes. And I think it's actually an actress who can you know, portray an East African voice. But I've had numerous recent repeated requests and I kind of want to, so uh, but yes. Readings. Yes, maybe this, maybe maybe this is the solution. Yes. yes. So um. the book is um, set in the late 19th century mm -hmm. um, in that opulent Persian course mm -hmm. of the Hajars. Mm -hmm. It's a time of growing dissent um, there's interference from Russia, mm. Britain, mm -hmm. we have an aging Shah, um, a very unsuitable heir. <laughs> <laughs> yes. How do you go from reading that one account mm. to then expanding into this world that you have created in this book? Mm. I think to give credit to the uh, the people that I'm writing about, um, they themselves uh, were very interesting, you know. So I first came across the story uh, because the Shah at the time, Nasir al-Din, was an avid photographer. He took photos of his slaves, you know. And so it's interesting, we wouldn't know of the story if he hadn't taken photos of them and the significance of how they dressed, uh, you know, was the spark. And it was then um, researching more about the time and more about the Abyssinian slaves that I came across a text um, written by an academic who 
I later uh, reached out to, and he responded to me very well. You know, he's in my acknowledgement, so I, I, I'm grateful to him. And he had this um, this paragraph from Jamila, and so um, and so it, it kickstarted everything off. But it was a really interesting uh, backdrop and world that I could play with. You know that. The, you know, the Shah was an avid Europhile, his, you know, one of his sons was an ardent painter, you know, there's a whole, and as you said, there's the, you know, the international relations, the, you know, all of that complexity. It was a very, it was a culture that was very rich in um, art, beauty, aesthetics, politics. And so, um, yeah, I think I kind of laced her into that and uh, built from the pre-existing, the skeleton, if you like, that was there. And before we go on, just a reminder to anybody watching mm -hmm. and viewing, if you feel to add your questions, please feel free to. And Victoria will try her best to answer them in a while. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so one thing I wanted to speak to you about is the hierarchies. This is something we've spoken about mm -hmm. a few times now. We have the Shah and his sons mm -hmm. and the members of his court. Yeah. We have the women, his wives, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. his concubines. Mm -hmm. The elder wives, the younger wives, yes, yeah, and we have you enslaved. Mm -hmm. We have the eunuchs, the concubines, mm -hmm. and the domestics. And yeah. within all of these groups, there mm -hmm. are hierarchies, and there is a struggle for power between all of them. How conscious were you of that whilst you were writing it? Um, that was entirely intentional. Uh, and one thing I've said to you before is that you ask the best questions. <laughs> I think one of the perks of um, one of the perks of writing is, you know, you, you were very often very intentional about at least I was every mm -hmm. single part of the story, and it's really um, it's satisfying when people pick up on that. I think to the point that we think of hierarchies in a very particular way, where we look at the most dominant, we pay attention to most dominant who is directly beneath them you can tie it um you can tie i actually probably should speak louder to be honest um, <laughs> um you can you can tie it very closely to um something that kimberly Crenshaw talks about in today's society she talks about identity politics flattening um the nuances of difference and how when we think of identity politics we just think about uh, the dominant power groups right so the group that is most powerful and the group maybe directly underneath, underneath that is uh, that is disadvantaged. And so I think it's important to, to think about all the different ways in which the groups we assume are invisible actually have their own roles and relationships to dominance and are playing their own, um, I don't want to say playing their own games, but have their own strategies. You know, there is, there is always, there's always more nuance than simply being oppressed. Who are you then? How are you responding to the people who are below you? How are you then navigating that? How do you how do you affirm yourself if you are being oppressed? If that feels like a lack of dignity, how do you then navigate your life with the other people around you? Do you show compassion? Do you do they bear the brunt of your you know disgruntled response to the life you live? So yeah, that was all very intentional because there were so many nuanced uh, dynamics, and it was really it was really important to me that um, you that you saw that particular characters were you know, oblivious to the harms they potentially brought on other people, even as they you know, advocated on behalf of their own rights and needs. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, it actually reminded me of, I think it was, yes, um, Octavia Butler, who yeah. said that we as humans are inherently hierarchical and flawed. Yeah, I, so she manages to be someone that I have not um, read, but um, I should. <laughs> I should. And with this push and pull of power that you were speaking about, you have the women um, in the book, littered in the book. There are many, many women, the wives, the concubines, the domestics. With all of them, there is ambition there is this desire for power. Mm -hmm. There's this desire to be seen by the Shah and to mm -hmm. be 
above everyone else. Mm, mm. And with some of them, there are very obvious acts to push for that power. With some, there are very quiet acts of rebellion. Mm. Ah, hold on. We're getting a comment very kindly saying that could we pause and turn off the phone as it's very loud. So, um, yeah. 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 <laughs> Loved ones both engaged, but, but not that engaged because, you know, tough way conversations are just that interesting. <laughs> I want to be the most special person in everybody's life at every moment, but alas. Um, <laughs> this is your moment. <laughs> Yes, um, but yes, uh, nevertheless, still speak louder, and I will use it as impetus to speak louder as well. So yes. We can, yes, sorry, is that me? Um, <laughs> Resume your question. Resume your uh, question. I yes, will stop so, reading the comments. So women who are all pushing to change the status quo yeah. in the Qajar courts, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. all women, um, Jamila. Mm -hmm. This sort of feeds also into the Jamila. I, as a character, I felt, I think we've spoken about this, and maybe I'm projecting a little, but I felt that she was quite defiant mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm, as a character, mm -hmm, quite mm -hmm. rebellious. Mm -hmm. And there were also flashes of rage that we saw yeah. in the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just wondered if you could expand on that. So, yeah, it's 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 a really good question, um, or rather a really good point to to highlight. So there are a few ways of thinking about it. In the in the court, you know, it's essentially an ecosystem, right? There are eighty wives. There are a number of dancers. There are there are so many different people living in this space. Um, realistically, it becomes uh, simplistic to think of it purely as a set of women, uh, you know trying to seduce the Shah at any one point. There's a whole, it's a whole life, there's a whole world. Um, and in any system, in any, in any network, in any community, you have you know, laws, rules, you know, responsibilities. They are given roles to do, you know, there's, you know, so-and-so keep of the jewels and running this and all of this kind of stuff. And I think um, there's, there's a sense of, and we've talked about this, how, how you give meaning to your life, right? How you give purpose to your life, what you do with your day, with your time, within the, the remits that you're given. You know, um, at the beginning, Jamila's restlessness is, uh, you know, she's asked, well, do you want to work in the theater, which is also within the court? Do you want to work at the coffee house? You know, they have this mini world of things and places and spaces uh, that you can entertain yourself with, you know, and you can feel like you are doing something even though maybe it amounts to, to play acting of a sort. Um, I think with the flashes of rage, it was, to me, it was a very real reflection of how you live under a form of oppression in that, especially one where you have the faculties and the autonomy uh, that means that you can spend a significant amount of time feeling relatively human. At the same time, you are reminded not not constantly and not infrequently. And that time between where you were kind of constantly subjected, where you were frequently subjected um, to, to abuse, to harm, to all the manifestations uh, of inequity, it reminds you, and, and, it's, and it's so common that it doesn't give you enough time to assert yourself. It reminds you that you are never fully yourself and you never get to really um re really lean into any sense of freedom you might have and so i think it was to me important to to frame the response to that as as realistically as i could in that she doesn't live in a constant explicit state of rage she is practical and gets on with things but she has all these yearnings and she has all this frustration and she has you know and these flash out at significant moments of you know injustice or frustration it's it's a legitimate response but you do also get on with the life you are living in and it was trying to find that balance um to try and tell a, a you know a sincere story yeah yeah i'm linking with that with her warranted rage but also something that she was fearful of mm. displaying mm. 
I was really interested in the style you had in conveying this. Um, it felt to me like the, you had work to keep sort of the physical trauma off the page. Mm. There was, mm. if you'd like to, yeah, maybe expand on, it just felt like the imagery and the language yeah. was always a little yeah. bit like a step just after the moment. Yeah, I think there is, um, and I'm, I'm cradling this book like a baby now. <laughs> but I think I think there is a a tendency to depict trauma as a very physical experience, and I think this um, this, this this is misleading. I think it not only uh, fails to tell the full story, but I also think that it, it fails to tell the full story. It also becomes a kind of fetishization, right? Uh, one of the things that I am really uh, passionately opposed to and uh, determined to determined to not be part of is this idea that uh, black bodies become, you know, uh, forms of um, you know ju just exploitation and, and commerce, entertainment and commerce and. I want us to create um, create situations where we see them as human and nuanced. And I think that you know the the abuse, the physical abuse was real and of significance. But I also feel like it was almost a symptom. It was a reflection of the idea that people controlled other human beings entirely and how they responded to that. So if you compare it, for example, to the uh, trans-Atlantic uh, slave trade, right, it is very different in that the bodies are being used for chattel. They are also, you know, abused and exploited, but there is also, you know, a clear purpose. They are using them like horses. It is extreme. There is also a functionality there. This is a situation where it is a lot more like using um, like using a toy, you know, they, they are mostly home servants, um, maybe at points, you know, they are tutors, they, you know, tutor all your children, they advise kings, they have this kind of proximity to power. But at the same time, you know, they could also be the playthings of, you know, their, their masters of these royals. And what that means is that they can be treated well if someone feels like it. And, you know, they had access to money, they had access to power, certain uh, slaves would inherit money, they would, you know, give birth to free children, you know, there was all of this, but then they might also, you know, experience the, the, the wrath, the other side. Yes. And it's that sense that this is almost a plaything. The way you, if you think of how young people use toys, like how children use toys, they might care for them, they might throw it to the And this is how human beings are being uh, treated by their masses, and that's the... And I think focusing just on the physicality misses the nuance in the way they are being, um, what, what, what's being responded to, what the physicality is simply a symptom of. Yeah, it's yeah. a long answer <laughs> to the question. No, no, it's a good answer. Um, it feeds into something I've spoken to you about before, the first few words, which just the moment I read them, I knew this was going to be something that I loved, um, but we shall be forgotten. Mm. And well, there's so many layers to just those four words. Mm. History belongs to the victors. Mm -hmm. who, mm -hmm. who writes history mm -hmm. and who gets to be remembered. Yeah. And in writing this book, um, with Jamila and Abina like, at the centre of it, we all bear witness to their lives. Yeah. Um, in turn, we pay respects to and acknowledge the fact that they ever existed mm -hmm. and the lives that mm -hmm. they led. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was that an intentional thing on your part when you set out to write the book, or was that something that came about as you were writing? Yeah, it it was it was very much in a way um, the intention because. You know, I, I was drawn to telling a story that was set in a time that I was unfamiliar with. At the same time, I've always been um, 
hugely interested in um, what was then known as Persian history, Iranian history. And when I found out that actually, you know, when I saw the, the limited first person insights uh, that was available at the time, when one is reminded that they were quite literally written out of history, you, you know, that there are, there is not a single, there's not a single whole book dedicated to these people's existence. Uh, and it felt like there was definitely a need to tell story, to, to tell a story that deliberately centered um, their voices. And the significance, I think, of the fact that it's historical fiction is that you are, it's not so much about the literal retelling of their story because nobody will ever be able to do that. What is significant to me is that when you use historical fiction in this way, you are giving people back their humanity, right? You are writing back a humanity into the way in which we perceive those people, right? So you may not know they existed, you may not know all of their names, but it's not a case that they are just erased. And it's not simply that, ah, yes, we can point to those three. It is a sense that this was an experience, this was a life, this is how people lived, and this is the, the human, this is their humanity, this is the way in which they engage with the world. These are the things that would, these are the things that were taking, uh, taking place at the time. These were, you know, their capacities as, as humans, as far as we understand what humans are capable of in terms of thinking and feeling. And here we bring it all together to reaffirm their lives. And, yeah. and I think there's something about the, the contradiction for me, I guess, in the fact that, or, or, or maybe more, it's more of a mirror. I know they've been written out of history. I'm writing it as they've been written out of history. It has uh, perhaps a, a poetic or fantastical uh, component to me to have the characters be aware of their encroaching irrelevance and their encroaching, you know, the, the almost proverbial tide that is coming to take them out. And uh, yeah, to be, to, to, to be recognizing that in real time and realistically, it would have been something they would have been aware of, you know, given the, the way in which funeral rites are held and the, you know, the, the dearth of that in their own lives would not have escaped them. So, yeah, I, and I think it, it's what shook me from the beginning. Um, I think it was a Zorni or Hurston quote, but it's, you know, if, if we do not, and I'm going to really butcher it, but uh, if we do not uh, speak out about our pain, we will kill it and say we enjoyed it. Yes, yeah. And it's sort of the same thing here, where it's it, it's this, you know, if you do not articulate your life, we will say you didn't you have one, you didn't, you know, you didn't. And so it's this sense, this dawning realization that yes, we will be forgotten. This is the most, this is the most horrifying thing, I suppose, that you will not, that you will not get to exist as you might want to be. You may not yeah. get to show up in the world as you are yeah. to other people ever. Cheery stuff. Yeah, so great. <laughs> <laughs> I bring the joy. <laughs> I... <laughs> um, the and prior to that, we were speaking about the Yetzirahs and just how their lives were so irrelevant mm. to those who mm. had enslaved them. Mm. Um, mm. There, there's a scene, obviously without any spoilers, um, with Abimelech having a conversation with one of his superiors. Mm who is lamenting people he has lost, mm. um, traumas he has survived. Yes. The whole time with Abimelech sitting at his feet, he has, who has been taken as a child and been made a woman. Mm. Mm. But something that is not seen in any way as a trauma or a heartbreak or a horror. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or something that even matters. He, mm. as you said, he was a toy, he was an mm. object, mm. Um, and they were allowed to do what they wished to him. And then you have the um, Jamila, and she has a conversation with one of her superiors who, again, mm. um, laments all her struggles mm. <laughs> in very dramatic ways. 
such, <laughs> such struggles they are, goodness. Uh, with that suit, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, their losses, their pain is, it's just erased every day. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, Through mm-hmm. every action, mm-hmm. every interaction. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's something that I, um, one of the things that, that I enjoy, uh, that I enjoy doing as, as a writer that doesn't sound too pretentious, is, is just writing the, the, the facets of human nature and how we live human in general. And this is just the kind of thing that a lot of people do in that, you know, you, you can often be witnessing or experiencing, you know, it can be benign, it can be you know, intentional, it can be indifferent, but uh, an experience of someone, uh, you know, talking about their, you know, their injustice mm. while someone else before them is, is going through so much more. I think we both know of people who could be having significant, since, you know, even life threatening health issues whilst a friend who knows all too well will be lamenting something significantly superficial. And I, I don't know that I consciously carried that example in mind, but, but those things have always, um, have always seeped into me in the way in which I, I, I engage with, with humanity and as an observer. I, I am fascinated by the things that make us, I'm fascinated by the things that make us uh, selfish to the point of, you know, extreme self-centeredness that we are not really aware of. The extent to which we can live so fully in our own worlds, in our own prism of life, that we don't even see what we are subjecting other people to. And we would not want to take responsibility for that. Yeah. And that ties to your first uh, question about, you know, where people in different points of hierarchy can be subjected to, but also inflict upon. Yes. And it's, it's yeah, it's all part of a, an ecosystem. So it's that imagery of you have the people and those who are standing above them, mm. trampling on them, mm. to lift themselves up, and it just continues. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah the, the, the pain of... Hmm, one's capacity to uh, recognize injustice yeah. can frequently be, you know, centered on themselves and their right, the yeah. stops here. And there's less of a sense of, you know, fairness for everyone yeah. as much as fairness for you know, me. Yeah. There's a point in the book where, um, you know, Jamila, Abimelech makes a comment to Jamila and uh, she says, you know, don't be ridiculous, we're not domestics. And he's like, ah, you know, yes, thank God for, you know, slave hierarchy. You know, just, just a yeah. casual, and he's being ironic. But at the same time, she's like, yes, don't be absurd. We're not that low. And doesn't think about what their lives must be like as she's, you know, thinking about the injustice of her. You know, and it's just people, we can silo ourselves off from other people's experience yeah. and feel no, yeah. nothing about it. Jamila, actually, before I forget that, I have to say, mm. she reminded me her defiance, her rebellion, I've not seen it in huge amounts of books, especially mm. when it's dealing with enslaved people, mm. but I, it reminded me of the protagonist in um, Andrea Levy's The Long Song and mm. um, Beloved, Tony Morrison's mm. Beloved, and mm. more recently Sarah Collins' um, uh, Confessions of Final mm. Anthem. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. These mm-hmm. Yeah, protagonists who, they have a huge amount to lose. Mm. Mm. But they still strike out in some way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did you? Is I know you, what you were saying about how you wrote Jamila and came about her. But was there any mm. anything in her character that you took from anywhere else? Was mm. something you had seen before or so, recognized? So I had very consciously um, decided that because because uh, there was uh, this sliver of an account of uh, the real life Jamila Habashi, uh, which, which is a very simple uh, paragraph that, that says very little about uh, her life. It is you know, a, a short narrative about her being moved from town to town, from man to man, mm-hmm. um, serving whomever. But I, 
I felt to myself that uh, given the dearth of writing um, from the first person uh, by their own hand um, by Abyssinian slaves at the time, that um, the mere fact of the existence of this was something that I could, should, or felt right to imbue with a whole host of a whole host of qualities associated with the kind of person who might who might write work that would survive at a time that was so oppressed. Right. So it was less about uh, pre-existing characters, and 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 to be frank, I you know I had the misfortune, I suppose, uh, at the time when I started reading it to have really not read enough literature that centered uh, black women and allowed and allowed them to be so wholly imperfect even as you reach for them you know uh, so which could quite easily speak to you know, my, my, the poverty of my reading as opposed to the literature that is out there but I do think uh, that there is a degree to which there isn't enough of those kinds of stories but so with her, I thought taking that piece of writing and, as I said, imbuing it with these narratives of, you know, the qualities someone has who is rebellious, who is defiant, who, you know, writes when you're not supposed to, whose work lasts when nothing else does. I, you know, I, I wrote her with that in mind. I wrote her as someone who is defiant, who is fearless, who, who is wrong, who is often wrong, who is correct but we still find it entertaining you, you, you know might be self-righteous i wanted all of those qualities because for all we for all we write about heroes for all we read about heroes those kinds of qualities of like stringent moral goodness we don't like them in real life you know nobody you know people think social justice warriors like, nobody likes this they're, they're slurs that people get you, you know destabilized by someone's you know overt moralizing and so even though she doesn't do that per se, you know, what are the qualities that may drive her to want a sense of self and want to articulate that loudly, but that would also, you know, irritate other people. And that was a kind of um, complexity I wanted to play with. Um, yeah, and, uh, and, and I suspect that she carries uh, some of my own worst traits from when I was younger that I thought I wanted to, you know, yeah. What's the point of having them? <laughs> You're like, oh, I hate it when she does. Ooh. Right? <laughs> That's familiar. Yeah. So, something you said that, yeah, um, resonated with something I was thinking with how there aren't enough of these stories. Mm. And there aren't, you know, there are, and they are the ones that we all know and mm. um, hold up. Mm. so high and but there just aren't enough and when yeah. when you say there aren't enough I mean in the trans saharan slave trade mm. so in the Middle East mm. um, the Mediterranean and mm. North Africa there mm. are recorded 28 mm. million mm. enslaved yeah so that's 28 million stories <laughs> that happened in yeah. The world. yeah so then yes. when you look at it that way that we've not even scratched the surface yeah but it's an incredible way of thinking about it. Mind blowing. Yeah. But yeah, 20 yeah. million stories that have not been told. Yeah. 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 And it's true. It is quite literally everybody has a story. So, yes. Yeah. There's a moment in the book when, oh, I'm kind of reading for time as well. I can uh, just keep on, as you guys can see, I've got so <laughs> many notes. It's ridiculous. Um, um, it is 7.45. We have, I think, maybe about another half an hour. Okay. So feel free to ask me more questions. But maybe, maybe at um, in ten minutes we look through because I think there's actually quite a few questions here which I'm quite flattered by. Um, I just can't scroll um, through all these. I can. May I ask you to do another little bit of talking? Should I maybe do one now, or do you want to ask a question first? Maybe I'll ask you this question because mm. I'll then forget. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. there's this moment with Abimelech and Jamila. Mm -hmm. and mentioned it to you before mm. it just uh, it was just beautiful but then brought so many of the themes mm. mm -hmm, mm -hmm, together mm -hmm, where mm -hmm. again not spoiling what happened but with <laughs> Jamila passes Abimelech by mm. and in that moment 
she does something that makes me laugh because it's a real huge belly laugh and mm. her whole body laughs mm. with it. Um, mm. at that moment she has this feeling which she describes she wishes she could freeze the moment and live in it forever mm. which mm. just it, like seeing it even now the hairs on my arms that it's just oh, such a trauma. beautiful beautiful um way of depicting what she is feeling at that moment mm. and it's that whole thing of how I said I felt that Jamila and Abby like you know there was such familiarity between them mm. and such mm. moments of joy and mm. solace um it was almost like they were slightly home to each other mm. mm-hmm. and had become mm. home mm. to each other you're such a great person to have reading my book. Oh my goodness! I'm just like, you see what I what I was getting at? All these ah yes. Uh, I'm sorry, I spoke over your question. <laughs> no, so yes, just more Extra. about yes, <laughs> <laughs> like, the concubine and the eunuch. Mm. Like, how mm. become... It's phrased like that. It's interesting, right? Because yeah. the, the the concubine is this hypersexualized figure, and the eunuch is this completely devoid of. Yes. Um, but their their relationship it. It is, um, it is one that is centered in a sense of hope. You know, they grew up speaking the same language. They come from the same part of Abyssinia. You know, um, the language they, they speak. Uh, I will. I won't go into too much detail about this. It, it is in the book. Um, but I remember actually, um, you know, really researching this and what it sounded like, so I could get a sense of, you know, when I'm trying to describe them or think of what their memories are. I know what I, what they would have been listening to. And so um, it's, it is that sense of familiarity, like what does it mean to, to exist in a world that is not just huge, if you think of the fact that they live in this palace with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people every single day, and they are actively irrelevant, except, you know, serving the, you know, the whims and needs of others. So to have someone else who speaks your language, who will remember the same certain things, who, you know, their life intersects with yours, they take the time to listen to you, to spend time with you. There is a sense of, there is a sense, not just of familiarity and not just of home. I think, I think a sense of self um, is constructed by um by having relationships or you know experiences or moments or things that are enduring right and um i think it's really really significant that that they have this shared history because those are the kinds of things that last yes right it's not a shared moment or a glance um and so i i really wanted to to convey that sense that in this really, uh, I, I struggle to think of the, the, the word, but, but the fact that their lives are subject to the whims of others, this is something between them that is, that is almost, uh, that outlasts this, right? It, it remains whether or not, you know, she's allowed to speak the language in front of, you know, whomever, whether or not. It's their own. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think, yeah, it, it was really important to me to to not just tell a story of two people who happen to be in, in, in the palace and are slaves. It is a sense of how how their relationship to each other is affected by their their goals that are not actually competing, but in practice may end up being so. But there is a shared desire to matter, to to have a life that that means something even you know, to themselves further than that and how and there is something significant in the fact that these are you know each person is to the other at least someone who who on some level would say they felt the other person matter right this is the one gaze that they have that is looking at them as a person when they're seen and so i I think in, in that scene that you refer to, I wanted to convey and reiterate what it felt to, to capture a moment that felt like it endured and spoke to something ineffable about humanity, right? Where you can't, 
you can't describe it. You just want to live there forever. You just want to be in that place. There's not language to really break down what, but you just want to be in that place. And I think um, I was saying this to you uh, not too recently. Somebody was was uh, surprised at you know certain parts of the book because they had certain uh, perceptions about the characters. You know, uh, maybe because they are you know clever or confident or kind or whatever and maybe the things that they're doing or the life that they're living somehow unfolds in a way they don't expect and one of the things that I I you know I'm not interested in like I said telling the, the this moral arc of the you know hero or the you know the, the winning arc of the genius or you know and it's very easy and to me patronizing to to make those the stories that we tell about black people, about, you know, forgotten black people. It gets a little trite. You know, the, the point is that they are complex, real individuals who may strive for things, may rely on their skill sets, may find that these things change, that these things change who they are. And I wanted to, I wanted to tell a story that valued with that complexity you know the story is very beautiful but to me uh but there is a sense that there is that they that it wrangles with the ugliness of humanity it wrangles with all those things that we hate about each other that we yes. you know that we rub up against all those levels of discomfort all that it, it, it that is that is what it is to exist right and, and that is what i want to give them the you know the opportunity to have i think that is what matters most to me. There are there are a lot of stories, a lot of well-meaning stories that want to give uh, black people these these. Uh, I, I've heard a lot about happy stories, joy, and such. I human dignity is not about giving someone like a a, a brush over, or like like a gloss over, a glow up. You know what I mean? It's about letting them sit in the richness of what it is to be human, which is ugly and messy and difficult and hypocritical, and often goes unnoticed. And I want to capture. I want to give them the opportunity to live in those spaces and be real, fully realized humans, not simply ideas or archetypes or tropes or forgotten people, right? They, they, they get yeah. to have that humanity. Um, and that's, yeah, what I want to write. Yeah. Well, Abby Malek and Jamila are both highly intelligent, um, highly educated. They read all the Persian thinkers and they write the letters Mm. for their masters mm. Mm. Um, in a way that their masters can't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you definitely have highlighted a broken that stereotype that people mm. assume mm. Um, that they probably... Will go one way, right? Yeah. 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 Yes. Not be able to string a sentence together, mm. you know, mm. Um, mm. let alone mm. be so educated or be someone who could advise somebody on their political yeah. papers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And also you um I was going to ask you about the language um which you've covered already about because you'd mentioned before how you looked at the syntax and the cadence of how the Absalons yeah. and the yeah. Sanzibarians yeah. would have spoken and it's very obvious through the book that mm. you have crafted this in their conversations. Mm. The way the wives speak, the way the domestics mm. speak, that the language is different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you didn't, mm -hmm. you know, we're reading in English, mm -hmm. you, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it conveyed that very, very well. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, thank you. would you like to read for us a bit before um, we carry on? Otherwise, we could probably keep talking a bit about but I'm not sure everyone would want to keep listening to you, perhaps <laughs> to me, I'm not so sure. Um, okay. There is a particular bit that I wanted to read. There is a part that you suggested I read, actually, mm -hmm. and I annoyingly cannot remember real time exactly what it is. I think I will try and just read what I wanted to and see if that suffices. Um, whilst I flip through my pages, because I did not have this page bent in time, I will describe it a little whilst I go flipping for it. So basically, this section is during the month of uh, Muharram, where um, 
Abimelech is sitting with the Shah watching um, a performance of um, the Battle of Kudla, in which um, Hussein, um, Hussein dies, but more importantly, he um, he's refused to, you know, bow to the um, to Yazid, and he he. It, I mean, it's a pretty compelling story, anyway. But the whole point is that he will always uphold his honor, and uh, Abimelech is is watching this and thinking about the lives of everyone around them. And uh, yeah, it's one of the things that I actually enjoyed most about um, about this about the research for this book is that I got to learn about this. Like I. I have, you know, there's, there's so much I did not know about the history of Islam. There's so much I did not know about the way in which, um, the way the way in which the, the, the Qajars actually celebrated, um, or celebrated different uh, moments in um, Islamic history. So in the, during the Maharam, the, the women are allowed to go to, for this particular um, performance of the Battle of Kabbalah, the women are allowed to attend um, the particular dawahs, and they basically never are usually. And so the, it's, it's just there's all of these different um, moments that I find myself thinking about. This is it is ridiculous that I genuinely cannot find this right now. And I, it's one of my favorite passages, so I actually read it myself quite a bit. And I'm just like, why am I flipping through this for like twenty different pages to get here? So bear with me. It is a very moving moment. Yeah, it's kind of you. Um, it will start to move everyone to irritation if it takes me much longer to find it, I suspect. Um, but bear with me, those of you who know me know how fantastically pregnant I am. And I promise you, <laughs> and I promise you that I am doing my very best. Um, Are you able to answer a question whilst you're looking? Yes, yes. So I, um, I just noticed there's a question up um, that was going to be the next question I was going to ask mm. you, and it's from Alex Martin. Mm. Um, saying that it's such a lovely book and I'd love to know whether you had the ending of the book in mind from the very beginning or whether it unfolded as you brought the characters to life. But it's almost word for word of what I've got written here. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> I, I absolutely love Great that. Great one, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, Alex, I found it. I will answer the question first. So yes, the ending is one of the first things I wrote. Um, and throughout the multiple revisions of the book, any uh, novelists um, listening will know that writing, uh, and I think any writers in general will know that often writing takes, you, know, you, you do a number of edits. The end has never changed pretty much. It, it's even if certain elements were added to it, the, the specifics of how it ends uh, pretty much remain the same from the beginning. I really wanted, um, the characters to have the ending that they did. I think it speaks to what I was saying earlier about the way in which I uh, I wanted to, the story I wanted to tell about humanity, the things I wanted um, to draw our attention to. So, so I hope that that is that that is seen actually um, when people do get to the end. That um, yeah, that I am trying to communicate of a lived experience and uh, yeah I think that to me was a very clear way in which to do so um, so um, it is chapter 19 I am going to read it I am looking and determined not to read so long that I thought, okay so I found where I'll start from <laughs> charming, charming. Save that for when I'm talking later, my dear. Um, okay, so, um, yes, hopefully this will not be too long, but, so, everyone saw themselves in Hussein. Nosrat used to mumble when inebriated that Hussein and he were alike. Nosrat, too, was true to his principles resisting his father's orders and remaining an artist as he desired. The Shah would claim the imperialists, either the Russians or British, depending on his mood, were men like Bassett. 
demanding loyalty, often wealth, but ultimately corrupt. Abimelech often felt that if the men were like Yazid, whose agents killed Hussein for standing up to him, then the Shah could not possibly be like Hussein as he acquiesced every time. Yet here the actor stood, wearing a tunic identical to the Shah's, woven with the same hauteur motif, but with brilliant new piping. He donned a white shroud and gazed for a moment on the bodies of his comrades, which lay strewn across the stage. Abimelech, who knew the routine by heart, still had to look away from the man readying himself to die. You want us to leave? Abimelech asked. He was standing barefoot in the compound, the mud melting against his feet. The ground turned viscid, slithering around his ankles as though to permeate his skin. The rain fell as if ejected from the sky. You have been kind to host us these past weeks. His aunt looked defensive. You have suffered undue tragedy, I know this. <clears throat> there is a man coming here in two days. She raised her voice to preempt and silence any replies. His name is Tolfami. He is a good man. A baby is small. We can keep her. But you and Abel will go with him. Why would you send us to strangers? I... Tolfami is a good man. Must we do this? Yes. Why? Abuna cried. We need the money. How? How? How will this make you money? Tolfami will pay us for the two of you. Her voice was choked. You intend to sell us? She didn't answer. The arena raised high above the heads of the audience, was poised in expectation. Hussein raised his head and suddenly Abimelech found himself gazing at him. The actor was always handsome, with a strong jaw and knitted heavy brow, but this man's face was haunted, hollowed out. Today, Abimelech could not help but reflect on his empty experiences, compared with those of Hussein, who fought for his principles, who had principles to fight for. He thought back to the wars that had shattered his home, cost him his parents and siblings. He could see the smoke from his mother's charred flesh rising as his hands covered Abel's eyes. He had watched her crawl away from her children and then run upright from a blackened hut, slowly, so that she would be caught, but from far enough away that they would not be found. He would not forget the wild cackles of sweating soldiers, stamping and cheering around the pile of burned bodies, oblivious to the three children hiding naked behind a nearby bush. He could no longer picture the baby's face. He watched the genies appear, men clothed in an array of vivid colours, the blue mood of the Tekir Daulat transformed into a multicoloured vision with radiant reds, peaches, whites and blacks, and a series of men in deeper shades of green who envied the same both his allies and his cause. As Hussein spurned the genie's help on the grounds that he must die to keep purity and faith, Abimelech felt a strange sense of grief 
wires like blood in his throat. Hussein's death was brutal and swift, and Abimelech once again had to look away. He thought of the actual story, the real Hussein, who led 72 men and their families through Kabbalah, refusing to bow to the corrupt Yazid or his men. He thought of Hussein telling his men to flee with their families for the soldiers surrounded them. He thought of his mother and the sacrifices she made when the soldiers came to their village. Where Hussein asked, she acted and both paid for their principles with their lives. Your face is wet, Krimino said with a slight chuckle, leaning past the Shah to look at Abimelech. I am hot, he replied. And as he helped the Shah to his feet, he saw that his eyes too were streaming. of the book. Um, there was a question um, I was going to ask you if it's up there and I, I've written it also. I'm Don't going you to really? come back to it. Yeah. I'm going to come back to it in one moment. Just I wanted to quickly talk about a massive part of the book mm. that we haven't even got round to <laughs> um, is throughout the book um, the threads of what connects blackness and queerness, mm. which is mm. just it, so many of the characters mm -hmm. um, in the book. Um, illustrate this for us. Mm -hmm. I suppose in a time before we had well, we had the term queerness, mm, you know, the, mm. and again, how much of mm. that was something you actively thought about? Oh, I think it was it was very important to me to to once again to tell a breadth of stories that were very plausibly taking place at the time. So, um, and I, I I will be quick. I, I know we don't have too much time on this save the best to last. Uh, no, um, so it was important to me to recognize the number of um, intimacies that were part of the abuse. And so it was also then equally important to me to show um, stories that existed outside of that uh, power dynamic. And they were across the entire spectrum. And that was, you know, as normal as, I don't know how to, to, to put it, I feel like I'm speaking a very kind of Western framework. Um, what intrigued me about um, the way in which relationships took place there is the way in which, you know, the Shah um, and the academic who came up with this photography, who discovered photography, um, he showed me um, images to this effect um, of, you know, queerness within uh, the harem. Um, but is you know not allowed to present those that will you know potentially affect whether he can return to Iran. Mm -hmm. Um but I think oh no <laughs> <laughs> it is the universe telling us that we need to wrap up soon. Yes. <laughs> um but um yeah the, the significance is that there were as I say about Okay, still the same one. <laughs> I was going to say if they all fell down, it would just be. <laughs> be like, bye. It'd be bye. No questions. No questions. <laughs> just go. And drink, just go this. No. Um, so, so I will be quick before the other person starts to get irritated. Uh, and morphism everywhere. Um, no. So um, the Shah encouraged um, his harem to, you know, form intimacy, intimate relationships within the harem, and again, uh, realistically. It, it is a, it is a, it is a home if you want to call it that. With 80, 80 wives at the very least, not speaking to all the slaves and women that you know are present there, and the eunuchs and all the rest of it. So it 
it is entirely just natural and normal that people will form relations anyway. And I think the fact that we have that plus um, plus the Shah's own, you know, photographic evidence um, meant that it was just a really rich uh, storytelling space for me to um, dive into. And again, I think a lot of social culture is determined by what we think is normal. And so it's important to uh, hold space for the breadth of stories that actually exist to reiterate the extent to which all kinds of, all kinds of desire, I mean, we live in a dark world, but all kinds of, uh, all, all kinds of desire between um, people who, where possible, are, um, if not equally balanced and power, treat each other with um, a level of dignity that aims to, to emulate, a, you know, an equal, a relationship where power was equally shared um, is something that was important to me. So where you had um, the abuse, and you had uh, the um, the actions of abuse that crossed um, heteronormative, uh, you know, run, run the gamut. You can see as we're getting to the end, I'm, I'm losing my articulate. Uh, I'm, I'm oh, losing my social coherence. Really so when you, yeah. Okay, so basically, <laughs> point is, point is that it was meant to be reflective of the culture of the time, of the culture of the time we live in, because it was as normal then as it is now to have relationships of all kinds and uh, that, you know, include all levels of power dynamic insofar as that can be abused, that can be harmful, that can be intimate, that can be beautiful. And we live in a world that draws too many uh, negative conclusions based on its assumptions about the way the world works. So I wanted not to shape the way you thought about it, but to kind of refute pre-existing standards and allow space for you to look at these um, stories of um, intimacy and how how we get this, how we get comfort, how we get love, um, as as yeah as, as broadly as possible. Go on, last question. Yes. Before we so start last question. This admit. is um, yes. Gemma has asked, and this is from speaking about erasure. Those who are forgotten, those who are trying to mm, mm. Um, write back into this group. Mm -hmm. How being the writer of this book, how would you like to be remembered? <laughs> <laughs> My goodness, how would I like to be remembered? That is the most, you know, th there is almost no answer to that that does not sound egotistical and awful. I'll say thank um, you, Gemma, because I wrote that and I was, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Gemma. <laughs> <laughs> I see you. Uh, so, um, how would I like to be remembered? I would, I would like to, um, I would like to live a life that allowed me to realize the things that I think are within my grasp. I think I think the question would like come up mm -hmm. across. Oh, I think um, the the I think that they're, they're meant to anyway um, mm -hmm. be shot across. But so yes, I would like to live a life that allows me to um, realize what I believe is my potential uh, in, in terms of particular skill sets I have, in terms of particular interests. Um, I would like to have that recognized. So I think, you know, insofar as being a writer, insofar as um, exploring various other creative to, did, I think it just cut out. Let's hope not. I think it might have just cut out. Let's hope not. So yeah, I would, I would like to, there are things I want to strive, there are things I strive towards there are things I want to achieve. I hope that not just the mere fact of the achievement is remembered, but um, the fact that, that I, I was, yeah, I, I, I strove to be someone who sought to <laughs> surpass what I thought I was already capable of, right? I, I think human nature at its best, if you want to know what work really is, if you want to know what has real value, it is to push ourselves, not in you know lazy physical toil. Well, not lazy, not in physical toil, but in stretching our mental and creative capacities. Um, and so, I would want to be remembered as someone who did that. Yeah, mm -hmm. who lived a life that was yeah striving towards a kind of self mastery. I guess um, whether or not she achieved it, <laughs> but uh, you know, have empathy for the I for the attempt. You're, you're on the way. <laughs> this is saying. I just didn't know if there were any more that we had missed or... We, yeah, frustratingly, yeah. yeah, we aren't actually able to see some of these questions, which is a bit of a shame. Um, 
And are we still on? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, there was a little back. Okay, so, okay. When did I know um, I was going to write the story? Um, hmm. So I think, oddly enough, on my birthday, on my 26th birthday, um, I had, was when I first took, um, was when I first took the, like about the first 5,000 words of it to in this writing group that I was in. And uh, I, yeah, and, and you know, one of the people in the group was actually um, not a writer themselves. And the other was like, oh, well, you know, this is just a bit too long for this writing group. I was like, yes, it is. I need to go and just write. And then I wrote about 30,000 words of it. And uh, one of my friends who's actually in the acknowledgements was like, oh, wow, this is great. And I think that there's, there's a level of like, um, there's a way in which people can respond to you and they don't really know what they have done. And for him, he's just a very kind person. He, you know, I, I could have, you know, I don't know, painted one of my fingernails and they go, yeah, good for you. But for me, writing was such a, a vulnerable thing and I'd never done this before and this isn't that much. And it was really the impetus to, to go back and uh, keep going, right? to, to really keep going. And uh, I don't know that I would have done this as quickly, as easily, if I hadn't had someone who knows me, who you know, knows what I'm capable of, knows what I'm terrible at, whatever, I think, you can do it, you cool. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, I think that, that, that was when, pretty much on the, yeah, first moment was on my birthday, 20, 26th birthday, 20th of July, and uh, yeah, maybe in September after that. So, we wanted to shed a light, we wanted to shed a light on this periodic uh, time of slaves and multiple slides, how do you resonate with the story? Ooh, great question. So um, I think what really drew me to the story was the fact that these people were um, intelligent and um, that they taught uh, royal children. And so to me, um, what made that, it then made this whole slave story infinitely more interesting because I thought, well, if you are, I mean, I thought of my friends and I who were all these like, you know, sort of, clever naval visas and I thought well you know <laughs> if you are honestly if you are someone who is um who is intelligent who is curious who has the time to you know think about things you know if this is a kind of slavery that is not day-to-day -day backbreaking work you know or day-to-day -day fear of your life so you are living in a, as I said before you're kind of you're occupying this space where you are brutally reminded of you know inequity but you are not you are not subject to it to the point that you can't live any sort of life uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And so to me, I thought if you are able to live and you have the capacity and the time to articulate ideas in depth, how are you thinking about this? And so to me, how did I resonate with the story? It's that. It's like, how, how, how would I... It's that I had been looking for a really long time for stories that centred... Uh, intelligent young black women you know there's a, a thing when you're a kid in the uk and people say oh what what sphere of history would you have lived in and so my limited you know access to information it seemed like you know, black women didn't seem to do very much prior to a certain time you know you just weren't told any stories you know like i grew up sadly before the age of the internet entirely right so i didn't have constant access to you know just again the breadth of stories that exist so this to me was was a chance to to see a period in history, to see a time where someone like me got to uh, exist, got to show up, got to use those faculties that are, that are often taken for granted, right? Yeah. Uh, so that was how I resonated. It was like, okay, well, this is an intelligent person in history who's young, black, precocious, annoying. I can see myself in that, like, <laughs> how would I have lived, you know? So um, how do you imagine yourself being able to speak for the character of it, you know? <laughs> This is Max Millard. How do you manage that? That is a tough question. That presumes a presumption that I confess is, is, is probably correct. I think, um, I mean, there were two things. One, I did a lot of research. There is, um, there's this academic that I found on Twitter who had researched exactly, like she was a res an expert in frustration. So she had researched like almost all the different types of like, uh, frustration related to um, units in particular and stuff like that. So I began 
asking her um, what took place, like what was removed, what, how that affect their lives, and and what that experience looked like. And so there are two things. This question. One, I think that um, one of the one of the true facts about life to to, to me, which is you know, could be hubristic, but something I truly believe is that we that the spectrum of uh, emotional experiences possible is as are ones we are all capable of having, and that is why uh, that is why literature can be so empathetic. That is why. Um, we can connect to other people's stories. That's why you can read uh, a book and, and transport yourself into a life you've just never had and feel like you can relate to it. And so to me, with a story like this, it was about trying to have that balance. I do not know what it is to be male, let alone to be a eunuch. In many years, I did not think I was able to write male stories. Like, I, I just have never been a eunuch. And so at the same time, I realized these two things, or I, I, I believed these two things, or I chose to believe these two things. And I certainly, you know, that one is simply that a significant amount of research will inform, you know, this kind of storytelling. And two is that um, many emotional experiences are universal. So what is, what are some of the key components of being a eunuch? Oh, there's trauma, there's shame, um, there is grief because there was about 75% um, of the eunuchs at the time died in the actual treatment. So there is being young and, and witnessing a significant amount of trauma. There are psych psychologists uh, whose work that I read um, and psychiatrists who say that, you know, one in, one in four children experience, you know, significant uh, debilitating trauma uh, in America at this point, right? And so we can, there's a huge number of people who can relate to a sense of a really destabilized upbringing that is brutal, that contains sexual or physical violence, uh, that contains grief, that contains loss and the lack of agency. This is a uniquely horrifying experience, but I think armed with that knowledge and one hopes the capacity to uh, empathize with how that would shape, um, how it would shape your the way you think about the world, but also your physical sense of self, how that affects, you know, how you physically go forward. But I hope it's sufficient. I also, though, do not wish to, to obsess on the physicality because I don't, um, because I don't want to reduce it to that. Um, but yeah, thank you. I just read the comment there. Um, Yes, there have been some really lovely comments um, mm. coming up. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, thank you, Victoria, for yes. speaking to us all about this incredible book that you've written. Um, I made a lot of love. And allowing me to have this conversation with you, which I could carry on doing for ages. We may well. <laughs> um, thank you to Cassava for hosting this. Grab this book at any bookshop. Yeah, now. yeah. Online, so, since yeah, online bookstores. Most bookstores can uh, deliver now. They do deliver. Mm. And people will deliver, and also you can purchase it from the Cassava website. Yeah, yeah. So, thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Oh wow. Oh, really lovely comments coming in, huh? Right. Um. Okay. So. So yes, I I will not burn your arm anymore and make you certain talk to me for longer. No, thank you. Um, thank you everyone for showing up. We have overrun, which is because I take too long to talk. Um, but it has been a joy. Uh, it, it, it feels like a really wonderfully intimate experience to be discussing um, this book with a dear friend of mine, with so many of you in the comments really engaging and asking interesting questions. Um, thank you, obviously, to Cassava for publishing this. <laughs> it's they saw the first draft. <laughs> they 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 know what they've helped me shape this into. Um, and so, yeah, a special thanks to Cassava, to Bibi, my publisher, to Leila, my editor, to Nikki, who's been our PR whiz, who's helped just pull all of this together. A digital launch is not 
is not what I expected or intended at all, but I have really, really enjoyed this. And I enjoy the intimacy of it without feeling like I have a huge spotlight on me. So actually this is, it's actually quite fitting. <laughs> um, and also it means that people internationally could join, which has been great. Um, yes, thank you, Tashmir, uh, as Gemma here is saying, for such thoughtful and engaging questions. I can rely on you for this. This is uh, why I requested you do this, but seriously, thank you. As I said, your questions, many people have said so many thoughtful things to me, but I don't think I've been asked really a single one of your questions. So <laughs> honestly, it was very, very exciting and satisfying. Um, I am grateful to, to everyone for showing up. I'm grateful to um, Sava, to uh, Maria, my agent, to everyone who read and supported this. Um, yeah, it, is, it has been, it's been surreal. It's, it's an honor to, to get to this point. Uh, thank you for being here on my launch day. Thank you. Okay. Bye. <laughs>